The European and American public are being systematically lied to about the Ukraine crisis. In this video, we're going to provide you with compelling evidence that the crimes against humanity committed in Kiev earlier this year were in fact committed by the new coalition government, and that officials in the EU and the United States knew full well who committed these crimes, and that they are protecting and financially supporting the real criminals. On February 20th of 2013, the world was shocked by video footage of snipers firing on protesters in Kiev, Ukraine. 21 people were murdered, and it was widely assumed that President Viktor Yanukovych and his supporters were behind the attacks. However, a phone conversation between EU foreign policy chief Kathy Ashton and Estonia's foreign minister Urmas Payet, which was leaked to the public on March 5th, reveals that the snipers were actually from the new coalition government, and that Western diplomats knew this and covered it up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that he has some sort of, how to say, trust among all these Maidan people and, and civil society. And second, what was quite disturbing, the same Olga told that, well, all the evidence shows uh, that people who were killed by snipers from both sides, among policemen and, and people from the streets, that they were the same snipers killing people from both sides. Well, that, yeah. So that, and then she also showed me some photos. Uh, she said that has medical doctor. She can, you know, say that it is the same, same handwriting, the same type of bullets. And it's really disturbing that now the new, uh, new coalition that they don't want to investigate what exactly happened. So that there is now stronger and stronger understanding that behind snipers they were. It was not Yanukovych, but it was somebody from the new coalition. For some reason, the U.S. media didn't think that that little detail was worth covering. But wait, I thought the opposition protesters were just peaceful activists who wanted a chance to join the European Union. Well, yeah, that's the official narrative that the U.S. media outlets are peddling. But the real story is far more ominous. It turns out that the most powerful and influential contingent in the opposition is a coalition of literal fascists and neo-Nazis. And they aren't peaceful. In fact, they're extremely brutal. The most prominent among these extremist groups is an organization called Svoboda. The Svoboda party, which traces its roots to the Ukrainian partisan party of World War II, was loosely allied with Nazi Germany. Until 2004, Svoboda had been called the Social Nationalist Party, a deliberate reference to the National Socialism of the Nazis. And we're not throwing the term neo-Nazi around here as an empty slur. The leader of Svoboda, Oli Tanibok, has openly targeted Jews and ethnic Russians in Ukraine for many years. In 2004, he was kicked out of Viktor Yushchenko's government for a speech calling for Ukrainians to fight against a, quote, Muscovite Jewish Mafia. And in 2005, he signed his name to an open letter to the leadership of Ukraine entitled, Stop the Criminal Activities of Organized Jewry. And none of this was a secret. The BBC was already reporting on the danger that Svoboda's rise posed back in 2012. And the EU passed a resolution that same year condemning Svoboda as, quote, racist, anti-Semitic, and xenophobic. Yet somehow the U.S. government thought it was appropriate to back these extremists. This is a picture of Victoria Newland from the U.S. State Department meeting with Ole Tanibok in February. And this is a picture of Senator John McCain sharing a stage with Tanibok in December. But why would the U.S. government work with neo-Nazis? Because they thought that they could control the situation. They thought that they could install their puppets behind the scenes and manipulate the situation in their favor. That same Victoria Newland who met with Svoboda in February was caught on another leaked call discussing who they would put in power. What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um... The, the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here, um, especially the announcement of him as Deputy Prime Minister. And, and you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now, so we're trying to get a read really fast on where he is on this stuff. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next phone call we want to set up, is exactly the one you made to, to Yachts. And I, I'm glad you sort of put him on the spot on where he fits in this scenario. And I'm very glad he said what he said in response. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleet should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you think well, in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Book and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Um, I, I, kinda... I, I, just, 
I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yats and Yuk, It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, it, I, think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. The mainstream media tried to draw your attention away from the important part of that conversation by focusing on the fact that she used a cuss word when referring to the EU. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He, he's now gotten both Sari and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Sari could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it and, you know, fuck the EU. The U.S. government thought that they could control this beast, but they were wrong. Svoboda and the right sector are not toys to be played with. These groups are armed, they're forceful, and they view this crisis as an opportunity to reshape Ukraine in their own image. This video shows a prominent leader from the right sector, Alexander Muzichko, brandishing an AK-47 in parliament, letting them know who's in charge. This is the same Alexander Muzichko who's made public statements in the past vowing to, quote, fight against Jews, communists, and Russian scum for as long as he lives. As long as I live, I will fight against Jews, communists, and Russian scum. Apparently, the U.S. government has been a little slow to catch on to the fact that their hand has been exposed. In March, a senior U.S. official told Reuters that, quote, Since entering the Ukrainian parliament in October of 2012, the Svoboda leadership has been working to take their party in a more moderate direction and to become a modern European mainstream political party. The leadership has been much more vigilant about expelling or otherwise punishing individual members who engage in xenophobic behavior or rhetoric. Oh, so it's okay to use no neo-Nazi groups to topple a government as long as their leaders keep their people from saying anything stupid in front of cameras for a few months. The reality of the matter is that, as ridiculous as this position makes Washington look, they're trapped. They can't deny that Svoboda and right sector are running the coalition government when Svoboda holds five senior posts, including the deputy prime minister position. And the right sector's Dmitry Yarosh is now the country's deputy secretary of national security. But what about that dramatic video, I Am Ukrainian, that went viral as the crisis was unfolding? It was so compelling, so heart-wrenching. Yeah, but who made it? A whisper to a roar. Who are these people? Oh look, a link in the description. Let's click it. They have a website and a behind-the-scenes section. Oh, it lists the filmmakers. Who's this here? Larry Diamond, inspiration and executive producer. He's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the National Endowment for Democracy. And he's an advisor for the U.S. State Department. You know the funny thing about the National Endowment for Regime Change, I mean, um, democracy, is that even though they call themselves an NGO, they get virtually all of their money from the U.S. federal government. You can easily verify this by downloading their annual financial disclosures. I'm sure it's just a coincidence that the NED has been pouring massive amounts of money into Ukraine to, quote, strengthen democracy and civil society. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Democracy, civil society. Of course, by now you've realized that when they talk about spreading democracy, what they really mean is regime change. And they are willing to work with the most despicable elements when it's expedient. This is exactly the same game as they played in Syria. The U.S. government funded known extremists, literal terrorist organizations who have been documented massacring whole towns. And even after those extremists used sarin gas on thousands of civilians and got caught by the UN, Washington still covered for them. Even to this day, they are still funding those murderers. They are still training them. And they are still sending them weapons. There's a word for that. State-backed terrorism. But the situation in Ukraine didn't unfold as planned. The parliament of Crimea in the south of Ukraine voted to secede. And they're putting the decision up for a public referendum on March 16th. The U.S. government claims that this referendum is unconstitutional and says that they won't recognize Crimea's decision as legitimate regardless of the outcome. So a foreign-backed neo-Nazi coup which takes control of a government without a vote is constitutional, but a declaration of independence placed to a general vote is not? Seriously, that's the best you guys can do? Who writes these scripts? Take a step back and look at the pattern. The real stakes of this drama are much bigger than Ukraine or Syria. And these are not random or isolated events. We are witnessing the final stages of a geopolitical chess game that is designed to end in war. But in order to get that war, they need to convince you, the public, that they didn't see this coming. They need you to believe that the other side was the aggressor. They're counting on you not paying attention to the fact that Obama signed an order targeting Russia with sanctions this past week and revoking the visas of a number of Russian diplomats. They're counting on you not noticing that Russia had warned that such a move would result in Russia dropping the dollar and encouraging others to do so as well. Oh, and did I mention that China is on Russia's side in this conflict? The same China who keeps our economy afloat by loaning us more and more money. That's a brilliant idea. 
start an economic war with China. These people are counting on you to be too naive to realize that economic warfare invites physical warfare. They're playing chicken with your children's future, and they think you're too stupid to connect the dots. Prove them wrong. We highly recommend that you verify the information presented here for yourself. In the description, you'll find a link to a page on our website which lists all of our sources. If you'd like to keep up with what's really going on in the world, go to our website, scgnews.com, and sign up for email updates. If you sign up for these updates, you'll get notified of any new articles or videos that we put out. And this is important because we're able to put out a lot more content covering a lot more topics in article format than we are in video. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus by searching for Storm Clouds Gathering or SCG News.